This video lecture covers biomagnification using the life cycle of mercury as a case study. Ebenezer Aluma is the original creator, and modifications were done by Derek Schmetzer. Before viewing this video, students should already have a basic understanding of trophic levels and mass and energy transfer within and between trophic levels. This work was made possible through the NSF-funded Board of Knowledge in the Science Classroom project at Ohio University. To begin this lesson, we will briefly review trophic levels and relationships between trophic levels. Put simply, the trophic level of an organism establishes its position on a food chain. Level 1 consists of primary producers like plants and algae. Level 2 consists of secondary consumers, which feed exclusively on level 1 organisms. Level 3 consists of tertiary consumers, which feed on level 2 and below organisms. And the last level, here shown as 4 or 5, consists of the apex predators at the top of the food chain. There may be more levels between primary producers and apex predators, depending on the complexity and diversity of the environment. Organisms may be more broadly classified as primary producers or as consumers. Primary producers, also called autotrophs, are able to create their own energy. Consumers, also called heterotrophs, derive their energy by consuming producers or other inter intermediate consumers. Most producers use sunlight, as in photosynthesis, or in inorganic chemicals, as in chemosynthesis, to produce energy and grow. So how does mass and energy move between trophic levels? Have you ever wondered why plants and insects are so abundant in nature, yet larger carnivorous animals are much harder to find in abundance? If bears existed in the same number as ants, humans might be in serious trouble. This effect is largely due to the amount of energy available to organisms at each trophic level, which may be idealized as the 10% rule. This means that for every increase in trophic level, there is a 90% loss in available energy, or 10% of the available energy from one trophic level is available to a higher trophic level. For instance, Plants are able to use, utilize about 1-2% to of available solar energy. Primary consumers, such as insects, are only able to utilize 10% of the energy stored in plants. Secondary consumers, which feed on insects, are only able to utilize 10% of that energy, and so on. Generally, higher level consumers and apex predators have to consume more biomass than lower level consumers to stay alive. So what is biomagnification? How does this have anything to do with us? For the remainder of this video, while we discuss biomagnification, try to keep trophic level relationships in mind. Biomagnification is defined as an increase in the concentration of a fat-soluble toxin within an organism between trophic levels. Fat-soluble refers to substances which more easily absorb the fatty tissues. For example, producers like algae take in small amounts of a toxin. First level consumers eat a lot of algae and take in more of the toxic substance. This effect magnifies up the trophic ladder, with apex predators exhibiting the largest toxin concentrations. Which foods do you eat that may have a high concentration of toxins? Can you think of any consequences of biomagnification on higher level consumers? What about the effect this may have on humans? Pause the video here to discuss these questions as a class. Bioaccumulation is similar to biomagnification, but occurs within an organism instead of across trophic levels. Bioaccumulation is defined as a tendency of a toxin to accumulate in the tissue of an organism over time. This occurs when the rate of detoxification within an organism is less than the rate of toxin accumulation. Bioaccumulation tends to magnify the effect of biomagnification. For instance, Organisms in lower trophic levels may accumulate toxins over time, then get eaten by higher level consumers, which accumulate toxins over time, and so on up the trophic ladder. The graphic on the right hand side helps to visualize the differences between bioaccumulation and biomagnification and the relative concentration of toxins within and between each trophic level. There are many classes of toxins which have a potential to biomagnify and bioaccumulate but persistent organic pollutants are probably the most ominous. 
POPs are organic toxins which do not easily degrade in the environment. Sources of POPs are mostly synthetic pesticides and herbicides sprayed in agricultural areas, but poorly maintained landfills, waste disposal sites, and industrial sites may also contribute a significant amount. The effect of POPs on the environment were brought to the public attention in the 60s with the publication of Silent Spring by biologist Rachel Carson. In her book, Carson conveyed the destructive force of POPs, namely the pesticide DDT, on high trophic level organisms. Humans have deliberately sprayed POPs without knowing how they interact within the environment, in some cases leading to ecosystem collapse and unidentified illnesses and cancer outbreaks in populations where spraying occurred. Ironically, the use of pesticides saves lives by killing pests which spread malaria or other infectious diseases, but they also bioaccumulate and biomagnify in the environment. In some areas in Africa, DDT is still sprayed to combat against malaria, but its use in western countries has long been banned. Have you ever gone to a lake or a river and found one of these signs? This is an example of a sign for a fish advisory. These signs serve as warnings to avoid consuming fish from the body of water where the sign is posted, as they may be contaminated with toxins or harmful bacteria. This sign in particular is in response to high mercury levels within fish at the site. If you ever come across one of these signs, there is a safe bet the water is contaminated to some degree. Mercury is a known neurotoxin and affects fetal development. It is mostly used in thermometers, electrodes, mercury vapor lamps, fluorescent lamps, antiseptics, and as a mining extraction aid. Mercury is a naturally occurring element found within the Earth's crust, and is refined to the elemental state from cinnabar ore found in veins created by recent volcanic activity. Mercury is also found in trace quantities in coal and sediments. Three oxidation states of mercury exist, and toxicity is highly dependent on oxidation state. Mercury, which is part of an organic molecule, is easily able to bioaccumulate and biomagnify, which makes organic forms of mercury highly toxic. This pie chart shows a breakdown of global man-made sources of mercury emissions. Anthropogenic mercury accounts for roughly 30% of mercury emissions into the atmosphere. The other 70% stems from natural sources and re-emission of deposited mercury back into the atmosphere. Re-emission accounts for both anthropogenic and natural sources, as it is unclear the origins of re-emitted mercury. Natural sources include volcanic releases, burning of vegetation, vegetation release from ger- geothermal activity, and erosion. Anthropogenic mercury is emitted predominantly from artisanal and small-scale gold mining, fossil fuel combustion, and metal production, but also includes sources such as cement production, the chloroalkali industry, and waste incineration. The majority of new mercury emissions to the atmosphere are a result of human activity. Methylmercury is the organic form of mercury with a basic formula of CH3Hg plus X, where X is some negative ion or ligand. It is produced by anaerobic microbes through a process known as methylation, where inorganic mercury is taken up by microbes and methylated with a CH3 group. Methylmercury is the most toxic form of mercury and absorbs easily to animal and human tissue when ingested. It can lead to a diminished reproductive capacity in affected wildlife. All chemicals have a unique cycle which follows the path of the chemical as it moves through the environment. Much like the hydrological cycle for water, mercury has its own cycle. Because it is an element, mercury cannot be broken down into parts, but it is able to change oxidation state and move from one form to another. In order to reduce the severity of mercury on an aquatic ecosystem, it must be either immobilized or converted to a less toxic state. Typically, we humans are much more concerned about methylmercury contamination in fish populations, as this directly interferes with our food supply and may leave us sick if consumed. When mercury is admitted, either from a natural or anthropogenic source, it is in the form of elemental mercury. 
Oxidation reactions may convert a portion of this elemental mercury to its reactive Hg2 plus state, which is also highly water soluble and may be precipitated out of the atmosphere in rain or as a solid particulate. Hg2 plus in water gets methylated by anaerobic bacteria to methyl mercury, which is then able to take an be taken in by fish and other aquatic organisms. Mercury is typically removed from this cycle as it deposits into the soil, but may become resuspended in the water column over time.